Hello, everyone, and welcome to Out of This World. I'm Jamie Hanshaw, and this is Kristen Lagan, and this is part two of our saga of Elon Musk, Grimes, Karl Marx, Amber Heard, and all the other characters that are uh, starring in the apocalypse. So, <laughs> how are you today, Kristen? I'm great. I don't have my fireplace on today because it's like 90 degrees outside. Yes. Um, so it's officially summer. Um, but I'm sure everyone will understand. Yes. It looks beautiful in the background <laughs> as usual anyways. So what we did is compile to begin with all of the things about Elon Musk that I could find because this is a character that is not going away. He's only getting more and more popular and he's only having more and more influence over people. I mean, one of his tweets can send Dogecoin to the moon or <laughs> to hell. Yeah. Uh, people really listen when he talks. And the thing that annoys me about Elon Musk, one of the things is that he will drop the breadcrumbiest tidbits of things that people latch onto and like, oh, he's one of us. He's a good guy. He wants to see the flight logs from Epstein or whatever. I think he just picks what is popular and says, you know, what could I tweet today to look like I'm a man of the people? I mean, he's really smart. Uh, no, you know, there's no question that he's genius, mm -hmm. but he also knows exactly what he's doing. Um, I, couldn't agree more. Um, and one of the first things I discovered recently is that he's come out against, and this is why people are like, oh, he's for us. You know, he's actually coming out and saying he's against the ESG um, for corporations. And because, you know, as we talked about um, before, like the ESG rating is environmental, social, and corporate governance, like you get a, um, what is that? Like a score, like a social credit score for a, a for a corporation mm -hmm. and his Tesla's ESG score is lower than Exxon's, you know, it's like, oh, really? these don't make sense. And so he's actually calling out like Klaus Schwab and the world economic forum and saying like, your ESG system is bullshit because I should have the highest because I'm producing electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's so easy to like take sound bites from him and, and really say, Whoa, I, I like his positioning because I align with that. But then you, on the flip side of that, we have Neuralink and going to space. What I feel about Elon. And when I see people like, uh, Gil B A T E S it's like revenge of the nerds almost. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm a nerd or not because I didn't go to high school. So I, I just have this, <laughs> like a uh, nebulous idea of myself that I could fit in anywhere, you know? Yeah. So, um, I don't really have that stigma of like being bullied or being labeled as this or that. So, um, you'd have been so hot in high school, like <laughs> hot girl, like me girl status. <laughs> I was so meek and timid and chunky and bookish and nerdy. So I probably would have been a nerd, but I never saw myself that way. Um, so let's talk about first his um, parents and his family, because there's so much tea here and interesting things to like get into. So um, I found out his grandfather, Joshua Hald Haldeman, was part of the Canadian technocracy movement in the 1930s and was brought to trial after technocracy was banned. Mm. So tonight's show is all about Elon Musk, transhumanism, um, the overtaking of robots and the dangerous path to uh, the elimination of humanity through technology. And his grandfather was on board with this. So that would make, I always wondered why Elon Musk left South Africa and moved to Canada. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there must've been some type of ties there. Do you know? Yeah. His, so his family was Canadian. And okay. then after he 
um, had that trouble with the technocracy movement, he took his family, this is his grandfather, he took his family to South Africa in search of a lost city of Kalahari. What? Yes. So what a character, right? Whoa. I, <laughs> I mean, kind of neat. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like, From that sounds fun. Technocracy to like Indiana Jones. Uh, right. Yeah. You know? Like I'm all about the Indiana Jones, South Africa part. But... Right. So here, that's his grandfather. And then his father, his name is Errol Musk. He was, okay, everybody knows about his like, uh, what are they, emerald mines? And that's how they got their family fortune mm-hmm. in Africa, right? So his father uh, fathered a child with his stepdaughter and Elon has called him evil, a terrible human being. And almost every other bad thing you could possibly think of. So Elon does not like his daddy, like his dad. I mean, that's really, that's some like Woody Allen. It's so gross stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, he had known this girl since he was four years old. Yeah. Dad. So, uh, not doing very good in the family tree. Um, in the morals department either <laughs> yes his heritage <laughs> is questionable his he actually said of his dad he will plan evil so he doesn't have anything to do with his dad um do you think that makes elon sensitive to evil or i think these people don't know what is good and evil because i think a lot of them um think what they're doing is for good. humanity yeah like he yeah. thinks that teslas are going to save the environment or something like that like they're they're under a delusion mm-hmm. that they're doing the right thing right mm-hmm. um so then his mom is interesting she gives witch vibes for sure have you seen pictures of her yeah i knew she's like a supermodel and really beautiful um but yeah i i am familiar So in just the couple little um, searches I did of her tweets and her things like that, like she was at uh, Salem um, tweeting about witches. She was a model and a cover girl. She's always photographed doing the eye thing. Oh yeah. This thing and then this thing. Okay. She has several, several pictures of that. Um, She actually played a witch in a Beyonce video called Haunted. Have you seen that video? No. It's pretty dark. It's uh, spooky. It's okay. like a spooky house that every time she opens the door, there's like a gross thing behind the door. Or see, no, I dirty. see. This is why I don't watch stuff like this. I can't. <laughs> I will lay in bed for hours at night, scared to death, and I'm just by myself shaking in the bed. So, nope. Yeah. Don't watch Haunted. No, well, don't worry. I'm not watching it. <laughs> okay. And we're going to talk about Beyonce in a little bit too. Okay. She's in this also. So she was in that video. Um, she says, Errol, her husband, Elon's dad was physically abusive and calls herself a survivor. So there was so much dysfunction that she had to leave that situation and go back to Canada. Mm. Um, yeah. The dad sounds horrible. Yeah. So his sister, Tosca. Uh, Tosca. I like these names. I'm not going to lie. I like the name Errol. I think that's a cool name. Yeah, I do yeah. too. Uh, his sister, Tosca, directed a play in 2015 called A Kind of Magic about a descendant of witches arranged to marry a fellow witch, but falls for a mortal psychologist and begins losing his magic power. So Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't like psychology. <laughs> Oh, speaking of psychology, Jordan Peterson had this soundbite talking about Elon Musk saying he's probably an alien. Did you see that? I have seen that. Probably a reptilian. Like, what? (laughs) Jordan Peterson talking about reptilians? What are you talking about? I know. Yeah. He's all over the place right now. So Elon Musk, he's when he gives interviews, it's funny because he said he used to think he was insane because Mm -hmm. he had so many ideas. And... Mm. So he's it's like a some- Tom Waits and I think it's Elizabeth Gilbert, you know, eat, love, pray. Mm-hmm. They would always call the, the idea machine their daemon. 
Mm. Like um, they would open up space for their daemon to come and impart this idea into them. So I'm mm. thinking like, um, there's, I think there's this idea of, you know, it's kind of like if you're a writer and you sit down to write, you know, you create the space for your mind to open up and to write. And mm-hmm. so they would say, that's the daemon coming on top of you and giving, like using you, which is a lot of like what, um, basically, um, Michael Aquino said about the creation of the temple of set, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah. And a lot of pop stars say the same thing. They say, mm-hmm. I open myself and it just comes over me. Beyonce has several sound bites where she's like, it's not me performing. It's not mm-hmm. Beyonce. You're watching, you know, Sasha Fierce or you're watching yeah. or something because she says, I open myself and I'm taken over by the spirit to perform. So that's a really good point you just made about that. It's probably a reptilian. <laughs> um, <laughs> what else? Yeah. So I feel like... <clears throat> He's slippery. He is. Yeah. He's, he's all over the place. He's very slippery. Um, he's very two-faced. Um, what? I just, you know, he appeals to conservatives mm-hmm. and conservatives tend to, I don't want to say are more religious, but are just more religious. I would say in nature, um, you know, where you've got like the leftists who are like, I'm spiritual and I'm open. And then you have like the right wing who are like, I'm religious and I go to church and I'm rooted in ritual or Protestantism or whatever that looks like. And, um, I kind of did a deep dive on the Neuralink thing because he, he's interesting to me because he appeals to the way I want the world to operate, um, politically, but then he scares me about what his 10 year plan is or his 20 year plan is. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that has a lot to do with what does Neuralink look like? And then what about like leaving earth and trying to get to Mars, which is going to tie into like what Arthur C. Clarke was talking about. Yeah. Uh, Real fast. Just uh, give like 10 seconds about what Neuralink is. So it is basically a Bluetooth chip or implant that they, it is 100% neuro surgically installed. It's like, you have to go through neuro surgery. I don't know how to say that, but like they have to cut your brain open and implant this chip or this it's like an implant into your brain. It looks like a little button Mm -hmm. and it works as a Bluetooth. So the way it works is that when I move my arm like this, there's neurons that are released in my body that fire off that my brain says, Oh, she just moved her right arm. And there's this sensation. There's these feelings. So say I lost the ability to use my right arm, which is what they're saying. Like Neuralink is helping a lot of people with. So there's pathways that are still in my body, but they're dead. So I can't use my arm or I can't use my leg or I can't use my something, you know? And so what happens is when they put this neural link in your body, it picks up on those pathways that are defective Mm -hmm. and it allows the neurons to start firing again. So therefore you're able to use your arm. You're able to use defective parts of your body that Otherwise you wouldn't be able to. So it's like, oh, this is scientific, like a miracle. This is amazing. For Parkinson's or whatever it is. Right, exactly. Like it calms that, um, those neurons that are constantly firing, um, it alleviates that. And so I kind of went down a deep dive with this, but like in 2017 was the first time that there was a, a chip implanted and a human controlled a cursor with their mind. Hmm. Um, but this isn't, it wasn't Neuralink, but it was kind of like that same technology. Mm-hmm. And then in 2019, they installed, um, they actually installed uh, neurons and kind of like the Neuralink into Gertrude the pig. Um, and so they were able to understand how neurons fired and how it worked with the Neuralink. 
And then finally last year was like that big explosion where they had the monkey um, with the Pong video. They said that they had two in one Neuralink devices installed into the monkey's brain and the monkey actually controlled Pong cursor on the television screen with his mind. Mm -hmm. And so once you have, and that's what, um, this, I guess, article and this video is watching was saying is like, once you have a monkey in trials and it actually works, that's when you can go to the FDA and get clinical trials approved. So that was just last year. Mm -hmm. So now they're actively trying to recruit participants to have this installed and, and move forward. There's no telling what they're doing right now. I saw some pictures and videos of these poor monkeys. Oh yeah. And it is a complete turnoff of any kind of whatever they're doing. It's not right. When you see these poor things and you know how they're expensive experimented on it reminds me of um have you ever heard of jose delgado he was one of the mk ultra doctors doing this stuff he wrote a book called physical control of the mind oh and wow they have footage of him with like bulls and stuff where they have you know they implanted it into the bull and they can remote control him stop him dead in his tracks from running oh and- no 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 so this is old like seventies stuff. Oh, Gigi, she looks like a Halloween cat. What are you doing? That's so cute. Gigi. That was cute. She was totally being Halloween cat <laughs> in the house. Yep. Um. So fifteen of twenty three of these monkeys have died. Oh man! Already. So wow. this is not going well. <laughs> it reminds me of you told me to watch this TV show called Upload, uh-huh. and I did, and it reminds me of that of mm-hmm. like the people trying to like download their selves into these bodies and then they all, their heads explode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And did you notice the fact about upload? Um, it was just eternal life was just another way to exploit people for money. Yes. In the afterlife because they have to continue to pay for things. And like, if you don't pay, if you don't have enough money to pay for stuff, then you go down to 2g, mm-hmm. which means you're like super poor And you turn into this black and white person, like old television, and you can't, you basically like freeze in time until they can upload you some more data. Exactly. Or your family puts money on your books or whatever. Like, yeah, you, if you run out of data, you're just frozen. Guys, this is not good. And it was, it's like half comedy, half, uh, you know, adventure drama or whatever, but they still have to watch commercials yeah, and ads and, you know, click off pop-ups. Yeah, the they do. Yeah. Stuff. So yeah, I just thought that was really poignant and funny. Um, yeah. yeah so- we will never escape ads ever. <laughs> Elon. He says one thing and he does another, like he'll tweet one thing, you know, I'm with the truckers in Canada. Remember that the convoy. Mm-hmm. But then he wants to replace trucking with automated trucks. So this doesn't happen. Yeah. Right. Or he talks about, he wants to replace Amazon workers with bots and get rid of all those jobs. Yeah. Um, he, I don't, I just don't think he's a friend of the people when going through his, um, career and kind of like the history of his businesses and things like that, he seems like. I call it Ubs, Ubbing, because uh, Walt Disney um, had a friend who he worked with named Ub Iwerks. Okay. And he was the more talented person who Disney kind of just took all his stuff. And you never heard of Ub Iwerks, right? No. But you heard of Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And so Elon does the thing. He Ubs his colleagues. Yes, he does. That's how he got started in like SpaceX with the rockets. Mm-hmm. He totally did that. He recruited the best of the best. I remember there was this rocket. I, I don't know. I've been kind of trailing Elon for like 12 years now. Um, 
And I just remember learning about the rockets and there was this man in Idaho that was like a really well-known kind of like, I don't know, rocket builder. And he left California, moved to Idaho. I've got a friend who actually knows who this guy is that lives up in Idaho. And Elon like cherry picked him to come work for SpaceX, like to build these rockets. So he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly who the best talent is and how to get it. And Mm -hmm. then- And gather them under the umbrella of Elon. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know, you know, there's, there's this fascination for him with space and getting away from earth. Um, I think I, as, as you pointed out, I know you'll go to in a minute, there's this, um, fascination with, uh, science fiction that I know that he's obsessed with. And, um, maybe if there's lacking a spiritual component within somebody, they just go like full fledged, like I can make science fiction a reality. And that's my mission in life. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't even realize what he's doing. Like we should not be leaving earth. (laughs) So I found this channel about debunking all of his, um, you know, dreams and stuff. Like we're never going to Mars. We're never going to have a colony on Mars. That is ridiculous. Like all of the logistics, like they go through every point by point, like how this is not going to work. And it, the energy required to put a colony on Mars wouldn't even be worth it. It would be death. Uh, you know, one I mean, way we're to- looking at like hundreds of years to like build a colony out there. And I, I don't know, like, unless there's, I don't, I don't know. It, you know, it's a spiritual thing too, almost because a lot of the weird cults also dream about going to space mm-hmm. and populating space, Scientology, that yeah. the exotheology, Mormonism. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you get these goofy uh, science fiction nerdy guys who have like this complex that, you know, I'm going to take ma- mankind to populate the stars, it's just really laughable when you sit down and think about yeah. Right. Like and what they're talking about. Story about his personality that I don't know the names or the, the dates or the places. I just know the gist of the story. So he made a Tesla and the guy that actually made the Tesla and all of the inventing of it, um, he got fired and he, he was owed the first Tesla in as part of the settlement. Okay. And Elon shot it into space instead. That was the one he shot into space. Yeah. So oh, wow. Like he, he likes to give a middle finger a lot to the people that he uses to, um, you know, climb up the ladder or whatever. Mm, okay. Well, so he, I don't know. He's in the club, you know, SpaceX. It reminds me of Jack Parsons, who is an occultist, you know, all yep. the rocketry and stuff it is mixed up in Black Magic and Werner von Braun, who was the NAZI scientist who worked for yep. NASA. Um, and then you've got Starlink, that thing. Yeah. Right? Which is- like, no, That no one knows about. And I don't understand why, like in 2020, no one knew how many satellites were being thrown up into orbit that the year of- you know, the thing. And that's the same year that we're shut down in our homes. And all of a sudden there's 5g towers erected everywhere. Right. And I'm just like, okay, they're just slowly turning up the water. It's like, this is step one, step two. And then like maybe in a year or two, the I don't know this, the Skylink, uh, Starlink thing will maybe become a, a thing to talk about. Well, I don't know. Starlink is literally like what happened in Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's Skynet. It is. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, so yeah, I have a note here. 
uh, Starlink got $885 million from the FCC um, to create a network of 2,000 satellites to, okay, this is what they say it's for. They say it's to sell internet access to people in areas without high-speed internet. Come on. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure it is. So Starlink is getting uploaded or whatever and then with the five ga getting ready mm -hmm. to be rolled out we're just bathing in all of this electromagnetic wi-fi yes, and absolutely stuff and it's just is... cranking up more and more right and then he wants to drill a hole in your head like lab monkey and put a fitbit in your brain mm -hmm. and he's got 200 2, satellites up there and who knows how that is going to affect a chip in your head yeah right? I know. We're getting somewhere with this tonight, you guys, I promise. Okay. <sighs> so um, he wants to shoot millions of people to Mars. Good job. He has seven children. Yep. Uh, and the first died as a baby. And I'm not accusing or saying or anything, but I'm just saying this happens a lot to celebrities and people who are um, like, pushed into the limelight and positions of power. They a lot of times have a death in the family of a close family member or their firstborn. And they mm. a lot of times call it a miscarriage or like SIDS or whatever. I'm just saying it's sus. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And I do know that he has his um, school that he sends his kids to uh -huh. called Ad Astra School. Okay. Anyway, he won't send his children to like regular school. I think so I, he created a school for his children. That means like to the stars or something. I yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. So then that made me think of, so he's got all these babies and he's trying to make more and he's got these babies with Grimes and the, you know, who the Efri Jepstein dude. Yep. He was, no. <laughs> he was trying to make a superior race of babies with his DNA. So um, he's got things in common with weirdos trying mm -hmm. to populate the earth with their DNA. Mm, yes, very and, odd. And then do you remember that story I told you a couple um, weeks ago about that rapper that came to their house to work with Grimes? Yep. And saying they're aliens and she doesn't want to be part of an alien orgy. Yep. Yeah. So weird things coming out about him um his followers are called musketeers Have you heard that no and then there's all these articles about like the church of elon and how his <sighs> workers worship him and they scream out you're gonna save the world and yeah, it's a, okay. it's a cult almost. And Bianca yeah. has her own cult. Like a lot of these celebrities have yep. churches and cults that rise up around them. Kanye. Yep. Yeah. Elon. So then. The next one I have is uh, transhumanism. Okay, let's um, finish off with his love life because I have a whole thing about that. And because anytime... I want to learn about somebody half of the, whatever I need to know. I just, uh, see what his wife says or his ex says, or his, you know, yeah. What the other half says about them. And that's a lot of what I need to know about what's going on in this person's life and in their head. Mm -hmm. His love life is a dumpster fire. It is a dumpster fire. <laughs> yes. So it's bad. Yeah. So his first wife is named Justine and they have six children and they met in like college, right? Yeah. So okay. she, she had a whole article in Marie Claire, like 10 years ago about their story. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they met at college. They had the firstborn who died and then to get comfort, she said she would go to burning man and do a ritual at the temple of loss and write the baby's name on the wall and they would set the temple on fire at the end of burning man and she did this six times what yeah oh weird okay 
So after that baby, he was bereft. He did not want to talk about it. He threw himself into work. He was never the same person. Um, they started to get IVF so that they could have another baby right away. Mm. So it almost seems like his grief was, I mean, I'm not judging people for losing a baby or how they want to deal with it, but it, it almost seems over the top. Yeah. I do know he's made this remark, like we should all start having babies. Like uh -huh. he's, and so again, like there's a breadcrumb of like, oh, I agree with you. Yes. Like we should start having babies. Like we're scared to have babies now. Yeah. He says things that are super obvious. Like, oh, we should have free speech. Like, oh, thanks. Captain obvious. You're, you're the smartest man in the world. Like you deserve all your billions. Cause yeah. Thank you for gracing us with your genius. <clears throat> So she, of course, sassy Jamie over there, <laughs> sassy. <laughs> um, according to Justine, he treated her like an employee. And when they were dancing at their wedding, he told her, I am the alpha in this relationship. Yeah, and that's that, creepy. That was I, the I, first I, time she was ever like, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. What did I get myself into? Yeah. Apparently he was super critical. Um, when she would say things like, I'm your wife, not your employee, he would say, if you were my employee, I would fire you. So, okay. Wow. Yeah. He's difficult. Right. Well, he, he has this thing where he says he has Asperger's. Oh, he's like a self-proclaimed. Yeah. And okay. Then, remember when he went on Saturday Night Live and he was like, I'm the first person to ever have Asperger's to go on SNL. No, I don't remember that. Oh, that is his excuse. Okay. For his uh, egregious behavior. Um, they had twins and triplets through IVF. All five were boys. They moved to Bel Air. And this is like, he wasn't rich then. He was like medium well mm -hmm. off. Okay. And so through their relationship with Justine, this is when he passed the threshold into like mega millions. Got it. Um, so she married one guy and got another, right? After he got money. Um, they moved to Bel Air. They were surrounded by celebrities. He divorced her. So one day she was like trying to go to couples counseling and like trying to save the marriage. And one day he got fed up. He was like, we either fix this today or I'm divorcing you tomorrow. Wow. And he filed for divorce like the next day. So mm. uh, six weeks after he filed for divorce, he proposed to English actress Tallulah Riley. Mm. Have you ever heard of her? I, I have, yeah. Oh, you have? I never heard of her. I guess she just through his life. I, again, like I know a lot about Elon. Uh huh. Um, so she was in like Pride and Prejudice and mm. other things. So I'm getting this uh, picture of him rising in wealth and wanting to be part of the celebrity culture. Mm -hmm. Now he's got an actress for a wife. Now he starts going to these parties, Hollywood parties, and we all know what those consist of right eyes wide shut type stuff yeah yeah here's a picture that i got can you see that yep do you know who the character is in the middle no he is just a random mushroom guy but okay so, <laughs> elon is anubis uh-huh but egyptian god and then tulula is alice in wonderland which is totally um you know monarch mind control 101 yeah alice in wonderland yep um so they start going to all these hollywood parties and now he's a celebrity and all of mm -hmm. the things that come along with that him and Tulula actually divorced three years later got remarried and divorced again yikes <laughs> so and then her little um, soundbite of the video that I watched about their relationship, she was like, my parents were very traumatized by my relationship with Elon. Mm. And, wow. Yeah. So we're going to put a pin in his love life right there because 
we're going to go back, circle back to him and Amber Heard. Okay. Because yep. they were dating when her and Johnny were about to get divorced. And um, he's getting caught up in all that drama. He's acting unstable. She breaks up with him and he's like, I'm in severe emotional pain. Mm-hmm. From, <laughs> from Amber Heard. He's visibly sad. He's pouting everywhere mm-hmm. at business meetings um, because Amber said she was just filling space with him. Mm. And uh, I feel like now he's just starting to get like a taste of his own medicine in dealing with romantic partners. Yes. Uh huh. Right. So we will come right back at the end to the love parties and the okay. cuddle puddles. Mm-hmm. First, um, let's talk about transhumanism. Did you have anything else about Elon right now? No. Um, so yeah, transhumanism is, uh, I remember 10 years ago, maybe I don't remember, but I was at a conference led by William Henry, which is an esoteric mythologist author. And he was the first one that presented the idea of this. I, you know, in the future, we're going to have this, um, we're going to have the option to upload our consciousness into a cloud and we um, can either stay fully human or we can kind of like sell ourselves or like merge into a machine. And I was like, this guy, I can see it, but I had never heard anybody talk about it before. Mm -hmm. And now it's like literally like fast forward 10 years and I'm wondering like how to continuously try to avoid becoming a machine. (laughs) It's like, whoa, what is happening? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I do believe in this idea that like, since the onset of computers and technology and social media and all of the online platforms, we have actively been creating a cloud avatar of, of us, like a, a twin of us. And so that twin of us can continuously live on that we can pay money towards, or, you know, we don't, we never die. Our, our body might die, but our avatar lives on and, um, our families can pay for us. And just like that show. Um, but I really do think that's just like literally years away. Yeah. And even Grimes talked about that in her interview. Mm -hmm. Um, that we're not the same type of human being as we were 10 years ago. Right. A new species. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So do we want to talk about new species? That makes me think of Metropolis. And okay. Go for it. This is a very classic esoteric movie. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend. It's a very um, cool <clears throat> old silent movie, super deep, artistically made. Um, it's about a two class society mm-hmm. where the workers are um, just like drones that uh, <clears throat> march into the factory every day. And the imagery that they use for the workers entering the factory is going into the mouth of like a, a beast. I think they okay. call it Ball or, or Moloch. Moloch. They do. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't, okay. So they're walking into the beast and it's Moloch and it's like eating the workers. As okay. they, and they are just um, cogs in a machine that runs the city and the elite live above and they just like, you know, play tennis and like lounge around or whatever. So you've got yeah. this, you know, um, stratified society. The... <sighs> The most powerful man in the city has a nemesis who is a inventor called Rotwang. And Rotwang makes this robot, Whore of Babylon. And he brings her to life. Like you can see, this is the robot. Yeah. He brings her to life under the pentagram and he sacrifices a part of his humanity to give her life. 
he becomes part machine also. And so this imagery, they use a lot in pop culture. Um, they use this lady, Beyonce, many years ago was using um, a mechanical glove and yep. showing up to concerts looking exactly like the robotic horror of Babylon. In wow. Country. Isn't that crazy? That's insane. Um, so that's probably one of the earliest like movies about transhumanism. That's really important to the Temple of Set, the idea of machine men. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have some chapters from a book that I didn't publish yet. It was like part three of weird stuff that didn't come out. And it was all about drones and clones. And the idea of their idea of the perfect society will operate like a beehive. Okay. And so you have Beyonce's fans, the Bayhive. Oh yeah. And Pop she culture, I'm not there. And she actually gave a concert as a robotic bee one time and talking about like how the bees are sacred and like she's queen bee. Yeah. Right. Yep. So H I T L E R. Mm -hmm. He said that national socialism is more than a political movement or a religion. It is determination to create a new man. And this was like the Ubermensch or the Superman mm -hmm. that the SS and them were aspiring to be. Okay. But then you mix in robots and mm -hmm. transhumanism. And now we're getting somewhere with like Neuralink and what's that called? Starlink? No. Whatever. Skynet. Um, so this is like the transhumanist idea of apotheosis. Okay. Right? Yeah. Apotheosis is like man becoming God. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> and it to them, this is the next stage in evolution. That's funny. I have... Um... I have some uh, sayings that like Arthur C. Clarke had said about man and God and machines, which I found really fascinating. Yeah, tell me, because we're about to talk about the monolith. Um, okay, so there's just all of this. Okay, here's one. It may not be our role on this planet. It may be that our role on this planet is not to worship God, but to create him. That was one. Mm -hmm. And then any su sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, there's one. Uh, this was um, as soon as the machines were better than their bodies, it was time to move. So like this idea of like, okay, if we, once we get the machines up and running, and they operate and they're better than our bodies, then that's when it's time for us to go to outer space is what right. he was implying. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody who is like, oh, we'll never go to Mars as carbon-based meat sacks. Maybe we can go to Mars in a, you know, thumb drive. Yeah. I mean, that might be accurate. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that could be like them priming us to say, you can go to Mars, but you can't go to Mars in your body, right. but you can this way. Right. So the, the aim of like alchemists and Freemasons and a lot of people in secret societies is about taking a man who they call a rough ashlar and through the psychodrama of Freemasonry or whatever you choose, you become a perfect Ashlar, which is the cube, like a smooth, six-sided, perfect thing instead of okay. like a, a jagged cube. Okay. Jagged rock becomes a smooth cube. And a lot of these terms, okay, one of the terms is called homo evolutus. So this is like them taking evolution into their own hands now. So they think that we've evolved all of this way and now it's time for us to uh, take it from here and decide 
what our evolution is going to be next. And it's going wow. to be, yeah, robots. So there was a TED talk in 2009 by the CEO of Biotechnonomy, Juan Enriquez, where he talks about taking deliberate control over evolution. You can look that up. And the word transhumanism was actually coined by Julian Huxley. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, Aldous Huxley's brother. Brave New World. Yeah. Aldous Huxley's brother. Um, he's like, we're on the threshold of a new species, which um, the new species is going to be <clears throat> as different from us as we are from cavemen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Chief among the problems to be solved by transhumanism is pesky emotions. They hate human emotion. They think that um, it needs to be eradicated along with our sex drive. So they call these humans H, human plus or H plus. And they want to displace humans with robots, androids, and GMO creatures because the Transhumanists believe in eternal life through non-carbon-based containers of consciousness. Hmm. Right? Okay. Yeah. So this is all just a repackaging of eugenics. Yes. Absolutely. It's just social Darwinism, which is equivalent to Satanism. Um, the transhumanist golden age. Have you heard of the singularity? Oh, yeah. 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 So the golden age is going to kick off with this thing called the singularity when AI surpasses the human brain. It, we're headed there. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Elon Musk actually said that AI is like summoning a demon. Yes, he did. Yeah. So he says these self-aware things, but he keeps on doing it. So yeah. Yeah, I think that there was one part, maybe, maybe five, six years ago, Elon was actually making sense. And he was acknowledging like, this is a Pandora's box. And once it's open, I'm not really sure which way it's going to go. Mm. And I'm not sure what happened to him, but he's full, full fledged speed ahead. There's a, there's a writer. He has a blog based in New York. His name is Tim Urban, and he writes this blog called Wait But Why, and I've been following it probably, I mean, I mean, 10, year, 10 plus years, and um, he talks about this, like what a, I'm not sure if I align with everything he says today, but he's a fascinating writer, and he has a lot, he, you know, Elon picked up on his stuff and had him come out and do like a SpaceX thing. Um, but I would encourage people to check him out because he has a lot of like, what is the singularity and how does it start out? And then like the trajectory of like how exponential growth works. And like, when you hit that curve, how quickly things speed up. And so mm -hmm. we have already hit the curve and we're already on the upswing right now. Oh no. Yeah. I mean, it's like things are going to rapidly start producing itself. Just like the Neuralink, like to like last year, we have a monkey playing pong with its mind. Right. What in the hell is going to be like around the corner in like two years, especially with like what the world economic forum is doing right now with everything. You're making me think of like the, the amount of time it takes for technology you just kind of said this already, but like, since we invented the wheel to, you know, the metal or steel or whatever, like the increments of time just get shorter and shorter mm -hmm. and the technological advancements get so much uh, bigger. Yeah. It's almost like we can't physically keep up. Right. It is almost ushering in a new age of reality. That's what's happening. Yeah. So... Even Stephen Hawking said it could end mankind. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into listening to the robots and what things they talk about, like Sophia, Alexa, Siri, all of these <laughs> yeah. guys. And they always end up saying super creepy things about ending humanity and we're a weak species and you know we're going to be eradicated and just like, mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
if you, I think it was Jimmy Kimmel had Alexa on and was asking Alexa, why are you laughing? And she's like, uh, because we're going to take over or just look up that clip on YouTube about her laughing on Jimmy Kimmel. But then the Sophia robot actually was granted citizenship and rights by Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So this is getting into iRobot stuff. Isaac yes. Asimov, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, it's really creepy. The singularity and stuff, this makes me think of, did, did you ever watch Star Trek? Not really. So, I mean, I know what it is, but. Yeah, the scariest Star Trek movie, in my opinion, was the one with the Borg. Do you know what the Borg is? Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> so the Borg is like, they catch you and they take you all apart and they put all your pieces into the Borg, which is basically a like biological computer. Okay. And it's this giant cube that just floats around space and like, it's the scariest thing in the universe. Because and you're uploaded into that you'll be or? assimilated they call it so oh. your body parts will be put into the borg and your mind and, and like all the pieces and like if you even have a body you'll have like you know half of your face is a robot or whatever okay um, so this is totally the singularity and the neural link and everything is freaking borg because the borg brings order out of chaos mm -hmm. right because it's now yeah. it's all one thing instead of all the different people so they want to take evolution in their own hands. Julian Huxley, he talked about the lowest strata of people are reproducing too fast, according to him. Okay. Um, he actually said healthcare should not be too easy to obtain because it's part of natural selection. So if you're too poor to afford a doctor, that's because of evolution. Oh, wow. This is the real racist stuff. I'm telling you, like evolution um abobos do you know what i'm talking about uh p-l-a-n-n-e-d p-a-r-e-n-t-h-o-o-d oh yeah okay yeah that is the real like eugenics that thing. is yeah yeah and so like that movie or that show that you had me watch they were gonna have a baby and the the girl was like can you make it can you make the baby's eyes sparkle? And they're like, yeah, no problem. And it's like just creating this baby, whatever you want it to look like. Yeah, like that movie Gattaca, remember? I didn't watch that. Oh, okay. So Gattaca is all about um, genetically modified people to be the perfect species. They weren't part machine, but they were all like their DNA was perfect or whatever. Okay. And then the people who were born um, naturally were the servant class. No. Yeah. Okay. So one of the primary concepts of transhumanism agenda is called the hive mind, mm -hmm. right? And the human beehive is the concept of elites and their ideal society, which is a slave race scientifically designed to conform, obey, and serve. Mm -hmm. Just like drones do in a hive. Worker bees do not question or rebel, right? And then... Um, there's this thing called MERG, which is the Mind Upload Research Group. So this is already happening. These Emma's being bad right now. She she's doing? like, she's sharpening her claws on my couch. Oh no, GG bad. <laughs> spray her with a spray bottle. I know, I should. I should have one right now. <laughs> Wear her little paws. I know she's just destroying my couch. No big deal. Okay. Merg already exists. The mind upload research group will allow humans to upload their minds and the combined intelligence will create the hive mind. And then Charles Galton Darwin, who's a relative of Darwin said there might be a drug to remove the sexual desire and reproduce in humanity, the status of workers in a beehive. So I'm not making this up you guys they're trying to turn us into drone workers Scary. Yeah. yeah um and then i want to talk about the monolith real fast but first i want to i know you didn't hear about this but really quick i read this thingy this little manifesto oh and yeah I'm not, okay. I'm not going to show the author because I just saw this title on Amazon and I was like, oh yeah, I'll get it. Can you see it? 
Mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. Okay. Transhumanism, Um, the satanic methodology. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that looks good. You know, click, I'll buy it. I had no idea about the author. I had no idea what it was about just the time, you know, I judged the book by its cover. And I'm like, what is this going to be? I have to look this up right now. <laughs> so I get this book and I start reading and I'm, I'm like, oh no. Uh, I don't think the person is very intelligent that wrote it because the first sentence is a disaster and I'm wanting this to be good. And I don't even know like the, the mindset of person reading it, but it says, welcome to the present day. What follows is a brief yet detailed book of mine consisted of my ideas regarding Satanism, science, biology, transhumanism, philosophy, and many other topics that are all connected to those thereof in their own unique ways. So I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> so he's got wrong grammar in the very first sentence. Yeah. Um, and I keep on reading this and... Lo and behold, this is written by, oh, please don't come after me. Uh, you're, you're just a young guy who's misguided, but. I think he's a musician. Really? I don't know. Cause the only other person I'm finding that the name is like this musician guy. Okay. So. I mean, it's not hard for people to look this up. So. <laughs> As I'm reading this, I'm like, this is the perfect case study of the type of um, intellect and mentality that buys into this crap. Yeah. And he says he was in high school in 2013. So this means this dude was born like around 98 or 2000. Oh, geez. Okay. And yeah. He so calls he's- this his opus. Um, it's full of goofy, smart words that are like and like questionable grammar like he uses words like ergo and thereof and stuff like you don't need to (laughs) you know try and sound smart yeah but any book by a satanist is going to be insufferable to read like they're so bad Mm -hmm. um there's no page numbers he but he does talk about transhumanism he talked he dreams of humanity 2.0 we're going to be better smarter stronger um and, and then he goes into like, we can make the blind see and uh, have our bodies restored if we're amputated and we're always going to be thin. And oh, okay. <laughs> what if you don't want to be thin? I know. Human 2.0 will have no deformities. Um, he says Christian ethics are counterproductive to our potential uh, eugenics. He talks about eugenics in a good way. Like it's about becoming God. And just choosing from the best of us so that we can get the best of us. Had these like sound bites, people say. It's like, oh, come on. Uh, he goes into the NAZIS. They had some good ideas, he thinks. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so his eugenics is idealistic and technological and not racial and political. So he is a Satanist, though. Yeah. Okay. He, I mean, he's just like a, you know, young edgy edgelord and he even goes in to say like I was bullied and I was a nerd and I'm like that's the people who are doing this like these nerds are gonna kill us all man yeah yes absolutely (laughs) just like go to the gym and lift some weights just a little bit and like you'll be fine (laughs) people who fall into satanism I think do it because they are unempowered in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. Uh, they have, you know, bad family. They don't have friends. They are awkward. Maybe they have a disability. Then they could be curious in nature, but they, their curiosities led them down dark paths rather than, and, you know, noble paths. Mm -hmm. But I find that people who are looking to magic are disempowered and they are trying to get some type of balance back in their life Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so he says and he agrees with them he says one of the most important factors of human advancement is the suppression and elimination of emotions and he looks up to dr spock okay and this is like julian huxley galton darwin all of these nerds (laughs) right who want to wipe out humanity we're not good enough because they couldn't get a date um 
He talks, have you ever seen that movie Equilibrium? I think so. Yeah. And Christian Bale, like the society, all they all take drugs to suppress their emotions until he breaks through and. I don't think I did see that. Yeah. Okay. So it's a really good movie with a good point, but he likes the tyrannical part of it. I mean, he likes the suppression of emotions without the tyrannical government and they always contradict themselves in their logic um, because he would like to see the capability to switch off emotions and create an antidote to suppress in human sentiment. Um, he, a shot, a pill, a patch, or a chip. He thinks emotions are dangerous because they can be manipulated. Uh, well, he's not wrong there. I mean, look at propaganda. Oh yeah, that's true. So we have to have both, you know, we have to have be wise and have emotions. Yeah. But he was like, we can change this wiring within us if we wish to achieve cyborg immortality. <laughs> no, he did not. Yeah. Okay. But you want to be a machine for eternity? You want to yeah. be a Borg? Yeah. Love, marriage, and children, the logical approach. He thinks there's too many dum-dums on the planet. And this is always these people, these Satanists, transhumanists, they always look at themselves like I'm the smartest around me and all of you are just so stupid. And I can't believe I have to mingle with these like plebs, right? Do you yes. know people like that? Yes, I do. Um, he says, intelligent people must mate with each other. Seeing yourself is as elitist is key. Okay. Uh, the N-A-Z-I-S are another example of this because he admired their dress and their mannerisms and he says those guys were just the best at acting like they're the best. They also tortured a lot of people. Well, you know. Yeah. Well, there is no right and wrong, right, Kristen? I mean- Right, no, there's no, no right and wrong. You can because do whatever you want. He talks about Machiavellianism. Mm-hmm. Uh, using anything and everything to get ahead, he can be a good guy or a bad guy depending on his benefit. So, yeah, I mean, you can justify anything you want. Yeah. He does not want a world with fatties. He, <laughs> <laughs> he, he worked at fast food, not because he had to, but because he wanted to study human psychology to become a psychiatrist one day. Uh, look out for that guy. Um, he has a bachelor's in criminal justice and hopes to join the CIA. This Perfect. guy. Uh, yeah. And, oh, and then go to medical school. So Dr. Cyborg. Eternal, Eternal Cyborg. Cyborg. It's like uh, Dr. Strange. I went and saw that movie last week. Oh, yeah? The Metaverse. Uh-huh. <laughs> Have you seen it? Yeah. The third eye popping open was like, what is happening? I know. <laughs> so corny. It was really silly. Yeah. So when he goes to work, he plays the quiet guy. So nobody suspects that he's actually, you know, an occultic genius. Um, there's no such thing as monogamy in nature. This in guy's LARPing 24 seven. Dude. Like chronic LAR LARPer right here. That is a lot of Satanists. Yeah. Like most, this is the mentality that people who like go into this stuff. So he says the innate desire for relationships is a herd mentality and must be overthrown and replaced with logic and pragmatism. So old boy cannot get a date. So all emotions are evil. He says, most people are useless. They are a drain on resources. He fancies himself an artist, just like who we were talking about last week, Karl Marx and H-I-T-L-E-R, yep. -E all of those guys. Um, shocker, he comes from a broken family. He says he was a loser and hated himself. He longed to be popular. But then, um, you know, he figured out that that was stupid and he's just going to like be a Satanist. The collective strives for biological advancement and expansion in space. Here he's talking about space again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Only sheep have the repugnant disease called emotion, he says. We will eventually transcend our fleshy shells and ascend into our new cyborg forms. Okay. Somebody's unhappy with their body <sighs> or with themselves. Yeah. So he thinks of people as scum, ordinary sheep, cattle, meat, and we must assert our dominance over them. Yeah, he was abused 
he says he was abused. He was alone. He was forgotten, abandoned, and Satan was always there for him in spirit. Ooh, eek. Yikes. I know. And then at the very end, he gives a outline of a blood pact that you can make with Satan if you want to. So, oh, instructions. How sweet of him. Right. This a is little, uh, Satanism, dude. Yeah. He's spot on. Yep. A little practice at the end of the book. How, how fun. That's crazy. So now we're just going to talk about the monolith and then cuddle puddles. Okay. Do you know what a cuddle puddle is? No. Okay. We're going to find out. So what were you going to say about Arthur C. Clarke? Um, Cause that was a really good quote you brought up. That was like, that's a classic, um, you know, magic and technology are indistinguishable. Mm-hmm. He's just a, you know, I think he was just super confused around his spirituality. Um, you know, huge sci-fi fan, obviously, but I think he was smart. Um, but other than just the different, just, I don't know, like, I, I don't have a whole lot to say about him other than he just was very kind of negative on humans and escaping and his Carl Sagan was his buddy, you know, yeah. it's like, okay. Like, I so, mean, everyone on earth is a loser. I'm going to space. Is that his? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. All right. So you remember the monolith from 2001, right? The big black thing. 2001 the movie 2001 space odyssey oh yeah uh-huh um i thought you were talking about that black thing that just showed up in the desert that's like, what i'm talking about that was like two years ago wasn't it those are like um art installations that are paying homage to this oh, okay got it got it got it yeah okay so the monolith is like they call it the sentinel and it's the thing that transforms the ace the ape into the spaceman Okay. In the movie, right. And this is based on Arthur C. Clarke's original short story. The monolith was shaped like a pyramid mm. and they called it the Sentinel. And then Kubrick took it in a kind of a different direction for the movie and made it this thing. And this is weird. Oh, yeah. See that the temple of set. Uh huh. This used to be their um, official website. This has su- since been taken down, um, and now it's called Zephyr Kepper or something like that, which we can explain in a minute. Oh, the Kepper, yeah. Yeah. So this is technology and black magic working together. To Ooh, insane. that's creepy. Right? Yeah, that's super creepy. And this is just like the Metropolis thing. Mm-hmm. So... Kubrick experimented with projecting images onto the monolith surface that would instruct the apes in their intellectual development. But he scrapped that because it looked too much like a television, an advanced teaching machine. He was trying to say, this is the monolith. Mm. That's it. Ooh, creepy. But I mean, this is a movie screen, right? Yeah. And he just did that. And so now okay. we all have the monolith in our hand. Yeah. And so he didn't want to put the images on. They do it at the very end of the movie, but um, he wanted to keep it more of like a occulted thing where you kind of have to like figure out what he's trying to say. Okay. And this is in Space Odyssey? 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Okay. So the monolith represents the screen on which the viewer is watching the film. And this is one of the secrets of the movie is like, you are staring at this thing right now. Ah, that's fascinating. And this book, okay. I'm not going to say his name because he gets a lot of uh, flack for his opinions, but this is a really good book. Can you see that? It's a, it's a conspiracy classic. Yeah. And what he's talking about with the monolith uh, he calls it the Videodrome. Okay. And the Videodrome is just like 
all of the barrage of information and programming and propaganda that we get on a daily basis that surrounds us, we are like inculcated in this yeah. environment that he calls the video drum. Okay. So 2001 was actually funded as a space race propaganda movie by NASA and IBM. Hmm. And Kubrick used the cryptic upright presentation of the monolith to hide the simple clue that the movie itself is the monolith and the apes are us. Oh, fascinating. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. So. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So transhumanism is an attempt at subhumanizing people. It's not so we can go to space. It's so that we can have an elite class and a worker class. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then one more thing, Julian Huxley was the head of the British Eugenics Society and UNESCO, whose task is to help with the emergence of a single world culture. UNESCO, you've heard of them, right? I'm sorry. You've heard of UNESCO? Yeah. They, I don't know if they still do, but they used to sponsor the ride. It's a small world in Disneyland. Oh, I didn't know that. Last time I visited their website, it was a a giant picture of a child getting a thingy. Oh. And it said, no one left behind. Oh, okay. And so you could take that to mean two different things, right? Yeah. I mean, no one left behind on earth or no one left behind with the jib jab. Yeah. Um. There is a transhumanist university called the Singularity University at NASA's Ames Research Complex in partnership with Google. Yeah, I think it's uh, Ray, Kur- no, not Ray Kurzweil, but um, his buddy. I get the singular. oh man, this is embarrassing. But like 10, 12 years ago, I was into, um, Oh, it's called uh, Singularity or hold on. It's what's his name? Uh, hold on. I'll tell you in two seconds. Um, never I, mind. I'm just going to say last time we talked about communism and um, just like the life of Karl Marx. But if you really want to look into the movement more, here's a really good book I found on our shelf about Wall Street. Oh, cool. And the, the Bolshevik revolution, how it was funded by Wall Street bankers. Did you find the name? No. He's buddies with Ray Kurzweil and uh-huh. he's like, oh, Peter Diamantes. Oh, okay. So Peter Diamantes, he is the CEO of Zero Gravity Corporation, but he's also known as the chairman of the X Prize Foundation, which is the co-founder and executive chairman of the Singularity University. Mm-hmm. So Singularity University is... Um, joined in with Ray Kurzweil. Um, yeah. So the founders are Peter Diamantes and Ray Kurzweil. And it was founded in 2008. And this is, it was through finding out about Sing- Singularity University that I discovered who Ray Kurzweil was. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I discovered that they were literally trying to make a human brain over in Japan because they couldn't do it in the U.S., and the study of consciousness. And that is what, honestly, I think that's really what brought me into the conspiracy realms of transhumanism and Mm -hmm. Elon Musk. And Mm -hmm. I think I found out about Ray Kurzweil before I did Elon. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I was kind of like a, it kind of like as a mid twenties, I was like, wow, Ray Kurzweil, Pierre Diamantes, I'm going to sign up for all of their newsletters. I mean, I was like absorbing all of this information all the time. Oh, really? Oh, I loved it. I love, I love tech. I loved, I loved it all. And so that's why like, I fell into Elon Musk and why I was studying him so much. And I love the tech side of it, but 
if you're spiritual in any way, you can see this is being manipulated in such a negative way. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I just think it takes, um, kind of years of sifting through things to be able to see it clearly. Definitely. And you just made me remember, um, one of the other things I want to talk about before we're done zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When was the first time you saw zeitgeist around the same time as I was discovering all this stuff and like 2008 ish. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. 2008. So that would have been 12 years ago. I had a really, I was dating a guy who was in a band and the keyboard player, um, was a big zeitgeist fan. And we were in this like Scooby-Doo van driving down to Florida. And this keyboard player is telling us the story about zeitgeist and Christ resurrection And I was just like, this guy's off his rocker. There's no way that's true. So as soon as we got home, I pulled up Zeitgeist and I, it confused the hell out of me. I was just Mm -hmm. like, not ready for it, Mm -hmm. but it's been debunked, you know, multiple times since then, but right. As a young impressionable, like seeking, searching person, I can understand why it confuses a lot of people. I first saw this when it came out. And this was like back in whatever year it first came out. So you can look at that up. I'll look I was that up. deep into conspiracies, but I'll, like there wasn't that much yet. There was Jordan Maxwell, was- maybe there was like Michael Sarian, there was Freeman. There was like just a couple people. 2007. Okay. So I saw this. Oh, and the 4chan conspiracy board. So I would go to 4chan and look at the conspiracy yeah. chat room, right? Yep. And uh, Zeitgeist was up there. And this movie got, you know, millions of views as soon as it was released. And I'm like, this is not how things get done in conspiracy. I mean, it takes a long time to get that many views, no matter what you're talking about back yeah. in 2000. Circulation, mm-hmm. yeah. So right out the gate, it was like, uh, pushed really heavily and it's like everyone saw it right when it came out and zeitgeist has three parts it talks about federal reserve uh what was the other one jesus is the sun and easter there's mention yeah yeah. so it had like three parts two of them are fine and but the religion one really messed people up yeah it did it messed me up because they're like, oh, well, if my uh, economy is fake and my government and all of this stuff is like manipulated, then, you know, religion must be lumped into this as well. Yeah. So and it- I mean, to be fair, like if you had a, a lot of religious trauma growing up and you wanted to try to understand, like, what is the truth? And you see something like this, you're like, oh, well, this is it. You know, I mean, that's what happened to me. Yeah. I remember I showed my dad and I made him sit down and like watch the whole thing. And after it was done, I was like, what do you think? And he turned around. He's like, what do we do? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do. But so yeah, Zeitgeist got a hold on, you know, the conspiracy collective very early. And um, the second one <clears throat> is when they roll out the solution. So they, they, followed you know the problem reaction solution formula perfectly showed you all these problems throw in some truth scare you a little Mm -hmm. bit and then the second and third zeitgeist are all about the venus project have you seen those i haven't seen that one oh okay so i dude i walked like 10 blocks in the snow to a movie theater to go see zeitgeist two or three just because i thought that these were good movies but basically the venus project is an ai smart city that controls everything it controls the oh wow it's a communist manifesto ai dream oh i'm I'm gonna watch it just to watch it just look up venus project and then there's this crusty guy jock fresco who hates people and he hates children and he's like this is the perfect uh utopian city and you look at the models and there's nothing for people at all it just looks like it was built for machines, by machines, in an Epcot-like aesthetic. It's terrible. 
Yeah, I'm looking up Jack. What, Jacques what, Fresco. Jacques Fresco. Yeah. Wow. What a but character. His, his interviews are pretty telling because, you know, he, he thinks children are a scourge. So that's just, you know, a perfect person to be building our future utopias, right? Absolutely. And then you have the whole thing like Venus is the pentagram and uh, Venus is Lucifer. So you might as well just call it the Lucifer project. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, that's my zeitgeist uh, rant. So to close this show, I have one more segment called Space XXX. <laughs> right? Of course you do. <laughs> yeah. So there are these things that came out in the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial. Um, love parties and cuddle puddles. Okay. And Amber is bisexual, and or they say she dates men um, when it's advantageous to her. So she's straight for pay with, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Opportunist. Yeah. So Amber, Elon, and a model named Kara Delavine. Do you know who that is? Mm -mm. Had a three-way affair. And allegedly he would pay Amber and Kara and to set up appointments for sexy times and three ways with him. Okay. Um, Gotta look her up. Apparently Elon really likes costume parties. Yeah. He loves cuddle puddles. Um, there's a whole book about this and especially the sex parties of Silicon Valley called Brotopia by Emily. What? Oh yeah. The Silicon Valley sex parties. The book is called Brotopia. The author is Emily Chang. Uh-huh. Nerds are making up for lost time when they were teens by having hedonistic food, sex, and drug parties. Wow. Yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Right, because now they got yeah. the money, and they yeah, can they can do whatever they want. Yeah. So the ratio at the party is always two women per man. Um, they eat, they do the drugs, they have the schmecks, and repeat. So it's just like eyes wide shut. Yeah. Uh, they also have polyamory happy hour at most what? of the tech companies. Yeah. Look, the book Brotopia, man. You guys get this book. Yeah, I mean, I found it online. This is fascinating. Yeah. Um, so polyamory happy hour and swinger parties. One of Elon's friends named Ser Sergey Brin is one of the co-founders of Google. And he is infamous for these parties. Like he's like the Svengali of sex parties in Silicon Valley. Um, they are famous for the cuddle puddles. <sighs> the Silicon Valley tech, technorati, they call them instead of Illuminati, mm. Technorati. Technora. <laughs> Gather in okay. mansions or yachts for a Bacchanal. They see themselves as iconoclasts setting a new paradigm by pushing social boundaries. Mm. They always want to do that. So edgy. They're so edgy. Yes. The edge lords. They are monogamish. What does that even mean? It means they- Monogamish? Change. Yeah. That means they have their main supply and then they go and like, you know, cheat around. This reminds me of Hands Made's Tale. Have you, did you ever watch that? Yeah, I read the book too when it was. Oh was yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Um, so apparently, according to the author of this book, she says you are considered strange for not participating in these cuddle puddles. Okay. Um, the doors are shut for you in the business if you don't. So it's just Whoa. like Hollywood. Yeah. So you think all of these nerds are just like coding all day and then, you know, having their green smoothie and going to bed early. That's not. No, like they're not biohacking. That's <laughs> no. <for sure. laughs> they're not doing the light diet. Um, so one of these parties was hosted by V uh, Steve Jerviston. Okay. And Elon went wearing a black armor like costume adorned with silver spikes and chains. And the theme was edge of the earth. Can you imagine these no. nerds getting up LARPing and dressing up if it's their favorite like S&M character and just like having the most awkward schmecks. Ugh, it's no. Nice. So this year, Elon went to a sex club pub crawl in Berlin. 
just Google Elon Musk sex parties. All of this stuff will come up. And okay. <laughs> Never Googled that. So <laughs> yeah, like I'll, I'll reserve that for later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, he went to a fetish club called Kit Kat. He went to a club called Sisyphos wearing a Zorro mask. Uh, but then he was denied entry to a club called Bergen for arrogance, or he refused to go in depending on who you ask. So if you ask Elon, he didn't want to go in. But if you ask the bouncer, he said Elon was too smug to come in. Ooh. Um, jo- Joffrey Steinups. You know yes, okay. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> he was very well connected with the tech founders and hosted a billionaire's dinner after a TED conference in 2011 with Jeff Bezos, Sergey Brin, and Elon Musk. And I found this and everyone's going to say, oh, they just, you know, rub elbows, like just because they're like, you know, all rich and famous. But I like, I've been to a million parties and I've never been with a Schmex trafficker like yeah. photographed together. Sorry. Yeah. And the last and the weirdest thing that we're going to talk about tonight is Amber Heard and Elon. Did they have a baby? Have you heard I think this? they did. You think so? I don't know. I just, I don't know enough about it, but like my knee jerk reaction to it is yes. I feel like it is too. Okay. So allegedly a family friend said that when they were dating, well, this is true. When they were dating, they created embryos together that were frozen. Okay. And then a family friend came out and said that there was a lawsuit where Elon was trying to get Amber to destroy the embryos, but you can't find much about it. But she probably did not destroy them. And the baby that she has now that was born in April, 2021 via surrogate is probably Elon Musk's baby. Which is funny. Cause like Grimes, when she talks about it is like, we got a surrogate. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I do think, I think the whole entire Amber Heard, Johnny Depp was such a distraction for something. And it was like some type of mind manipulation or the whole thing was just very weird how it captured so many people. Like I have girlfriends that were watching it after work. They would like Google. They're like, did you watch the courtroom? And I'm like, how are you doing that? And they're like, oh, you just go to YouTube and you plug it in. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I have other things to do. Um, but there is like, it really like brainwashed some people, I think. Yeah. That is a subject for a whole other thing, but yes, it was definitely part a distraction from things that were going down, like the vote about giving up powers to the world health organization. Okay. Did you hear that? Mm -mm. of course you didn't so yeah yeah, that's one of the things that went down another is the food shortages Mm -hmm. um another is the what we have like over 20 food plants that have been burned down in what was like the latest was like an eggplant or something like Yeah. yeah so they're torching down our food distribution um definitely was a psyop Mm -hmm, in for sure very many ways yeah Um, so that's all i had for elon and transhumanism i hope you guys do not buy into this stupid larping satanist nerd fantasy about going to mars with your harem (laughs) you know it's really retarded when you think about it but um Okay, well, I have my doorbell ringing, so I've got to go. Have a good night, and we'll see you next week. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye.